During and after Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, he had an impact on the national park system. He was able to preserve land for the beneficial resources they provided. He was able to use his powers by combining his love for the outdoors and his political beliefs of the federal government being a major force behind conservation. In all honesty, without Theodore Roosevelt establishing the national parks and doing what he did, most wildlife and plants would be extinct or on the verge of extinction. Instead of mountains, one might see 10-story buildings in their place. An interest in birds as a child had some impact on Roosevelt's outlook on nature. But when he went out west, he had a change in perspective and realized that what America was doing was wrong. And after his presidency, he became one of the most well-known conservationists in all of American history. It all began, like so many conservationist journeys, with birds. At age eight, the young lad acquired glasses that opened him up to the world around him. Along with studying birds, he learned taxidermy from a man that traveled with the Roosevelt family. As a little kid, people would imagine him shooting nearly every bird he saw on family trips. In earlier years, he decided he wanted to open up his own museum, and at age 12, he had his own little collection of taxidermy birds and other animals that interested him. Charles Darwin played such an interest in Roosevelt's life, he practically devoured Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. Charles Darwin also endured some influence on his thinking in earlier years of conserving. As he grew older, he started to branch away from taxidermy and started hunting for a sport. Even though he was a big game hunter, he believed that no animal should suffer. He followed the strict code of hunting ethnics, so that would mean he would never use sealed jawed traps. Throughout Roosevelt's life, he looked for and learned from naturalists, and John Burroughs, Frank Chapman, and George Bird Grinnell played a giant role in Roosevelt's conservation campaign. They pointed him to places that needed saving, they hunted and camped with him, and they made him feel part of a brotherhood of naturalists that then grew into a brotherhood of conservationists. When Theodore Roosevelt took a special trip to North Dakota to go big game hunting, he got some new perspective that changed the way he thought about preserving the West. Roosevelt first came to the Badlands in September of 1883. He initially went there to go big game hunting, but by the time he got there, the last large herds of bison were gone. Hide hunters and disease had diminished them. As he spent more time in North Dakota, he became increasingly alarmed by the damage that was being done to the land and wildlife. He even witnessed the virtual destruction of some big game species. Conservation increasingly became one of Roosevelt's main concerns for this country. After becoming president, he used his authorities to create the United States Forest Service and establish bird reservations, national game preservations, national forests, national parks, and permitted the 1906 American Antiquities Act. Even though Roosevelt wanted to save the lands for their natural resources and wildlife, he also wanted to save it for his own personal reasons. When Roosevelt's young wife died the following year, he returned to the Badlands to heal himself, spiritually, and develop himself physically. He hurled himself into ranching, hunting, and writing. In some ways, the Badlands rescued him, and Roosevelt's determination in later years to preserve as much of the West as he could was, to some extent, a desire to return the favor. A little bit after Roosevelt's time of being the president, he went up against the Congress and fought for the conservation of natural resources. He talked about how we use too much of these resources and that we would do just fine with a little less. He said that our nation is not seeing what we are destroying. But once we see the damage we have made, we will want to change the error of our ways. Since conserving was the most important thing to him at that time, he forgot all about the other problems that were happening in America. He was so focused that he neglected to think about all the fundamental problems that would come along with conserving natural resources. By the time he took over the presidency after McKinley's assassination in 1901, Roosevelt was at the peak of his environmental action. After a few years of fighting the Congress, he created the National Wildlife Refuge System 
made the United States Forest Service and helped the establishment of the Biological Survey for Wildlife and Habitat Protection. The maps at the end of the book, illustrations of the National Forest, Federal Bird Reservations, and National Parks and Monuments Roosevelt created or expanded are well-expressed proof of his success. Even with, with all of his success, he still failed to conserve some part of land and wildlife. He failed to secure the beautiful Hetch Hetchy Valley inside Yosemite National Park, which was eventually flooded to provide water and hydroelectric power for San Francisco. One of the main questions, though, is how did he get the word out? One way is he charmed and dazzled the reporters in interviews and news conferences. But those interviews and conferences were designed to place his personality and administration in the most favorable way. This manipulation of the press enabled Roosevelt to dodge the unshakable congressional power. Roosevelt is credited with recognizing the needs of unsophisticated Washington, D.C. Reporters for news and supplying it so successfully that he may have received the strongest press report of any other modern-day president. An interest in birds as a child had some impact on Roosevelt's outlook on nature, but when he went out west, he had a change in perspective and realized that what America was doing was wrong. And after his presidency, he became one of the most well-known conservationists in all of American history. Roosevelt had an an immense contribution to the conserving of natural resources. Without him, the U.S. might not even come close to the 234 million acres of federal bird reservations, national game preservations, national forests, national parks, and national monuments that we have today. This series of events was a major turning point not just for the environment, but for the economy as well. If all of the natural resources were used up, then businesses would go under and workers would have nowhere to work. So it was lucky for the U.S. to have such an exceptional president and a great conservationist, or else the world we live in would be very different. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated with it is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will, day in and day out, make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern them. I believe again that the American people are, as a whole, capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents pay lip loyalty to this doctrine, but they show their real beliefs by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderates, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith strive forward towards the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn back. Our aim must be steady, wise progress. It would be well if our people would study the history of a sister republic. All the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. Had pre revolutionary France listened to men like Turgot and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short-sighted ultra-conservatives turned down Turgot and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained 20 years' freedom from all restraint and reform at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror, and in their turn the unbridled extremists of the Terror induced a blind reaction. And so, with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alternations of violent radicalism and violent bourbonism, the French people went through misery toward a shattered goal. May we profit for the experiences of our brother Republicans across the water, and go forward steadily avoiding all wild extremes. And may our ultra-conservatives remember that the rule of the Bourbons brought on the revolution, and 
May our would-be revolutionaries remember that no Bourbon was ever such a dangerous enemy of the people and of freedom as the professed friend.